In Sefer Haagada, part one, page 66, we read about the conclusion of the construction of the Mishkan. When Moshe finished building the tabernacle, the Mikdash, the Mishkan in the desert, the Torah says, Vayihi beyom kalot Moshe lakim et ha-Mishkan, vay beyom kalot Moshe. When Moshe finished the construction of the Mishkan, uh, the Midrash reads the word Vayihi, and it came to pass as the word Vay, which is crying, meaning that it was a, it was a, a sad moment when they finished the, and they completed the construction of the Mishkan. And that's strange. Why would it be a sad day? You, that's the inauguration. Finally, you finished building the Mishkan. It took them a long time. So the, the, the Midrash says the following. Mashal emelech shaita lo isha ragzanit. Amar amelech asili parpura. It hila la asok ba. Kozma shaita mit aseket ba ena meriva. Says this is analogized to a king whose wife was cantankerous. She would always complain. She would always fight with him. So he said, you know what? I want... I think I need a new robe. I need a new royal, royal garments. Go, I want you to design for me a parpura. It's from the word uh, porfirio, which, where the word purple came from. Royal purple. You know, the, he wants a special robe. It, it would take a long time to make. If you want the, the real royal, uh, royal blue or purple, because it was made from, uh, from certain shells, and you have to do fine fabric, it would take a couple of months to make something the way that was, is fit for a king, right? So he said, go make me this uh, nice new set of, uh, of royal, royal garments. And as long as, so she got excited, it's a nice, it's a nice project, she, she's now dedicated to that. And as long as she's working on it, she doesn't have time to fight with her husband. So he's happy, okay, you know, I give her a project. And we do it sometimes with kids, right? They're, they're restless, they fight with each other, you know, how about this? You can go draw something or get me a... Uh, um, my, my mother tell, told me that in, when she was a girl, among Iraqi Jews, the, if a kid would bother the mother, they would send him to the neighbor and say, go get me what they called hummus l'qoud. Sit down hummus. But now the, the kid doesn't understand what it means. He goes to the neighbor and says, my mom said, give me sit down hummus. He says, sit down, I'll give you the hummus. <laughs> In a while. Uh, so, so the same thing here. Okay, he wants her to be distracted. So the, the king saw that the, the, the robes were perfect, were beautiful. He started crying. It's like, I tried so hard, she says, to do what you wanted, and now you're crying. He says, No, the, the, the robes are perfect, perfect. It's exactly what I wanted. But as long as you were busy, you didn't bother me. But now, this is going to happen, right? So this sounds like a uh, misogynic, uh, misogynist midrash, anti-women. But really, it's, this is besides the point that there were, among the rabbis, there were many, especially in, in the times of the Midrash, because of Greek, Greek influence, they were more negative towards women. There's no question. But the point here is the analogy of the, what the message that the Midrash is trying to send. This is... The, the husband is God, the woman is the Israelites, and the distraction is the Mishkan. And God says, as long as the Israelites were busy with the Mishkan, they didn't turn against me. Now that they finished and the Mishkan is built, they're going to turn against me. That's why it says, Vayihi b'yom kolot Moshe. God says, woe to me that they finished the Mishkan. This is an amazing, like, even scary statement, you think about that. God says, I only gave you the Mishkan, so you leave me alone. Don't bother me. What is the meaning of that? This is, this is really hard to understand. And I think the meaning is this. Uh, and that comes from experience that I had with many people who had problems with the way they observe the mitzvot. And, you know, with certain 
stringencies, humrod, this is how we do it, this is, and they, they become very strict, they look down at other people. At a certain point, people also become obsessed with the certain mitzvah. So there are two types of obsession. One type of, of obsession is you limit yourself on how you do it. Let's say you're very strict on how to wash hands. So you decide, this is how I wash hands. And any, anyone else who doesn't do it like me is not good enough. Then there's a, a different type of problem that one is so obsessed with washing hands that he starts looking into different ways to do it. What is the, the most uh, extreme opinion regarding washing hands, let's say, before, uh, before eating? I've seen people who would wash their hands nine times before eating, because first, before they say before you could even do netila, you have to have clean hands, because uh, because netila itself, washing hands is a mitzvah, so you have to wash to approach a mitzvah with clean hands, so with soap and with a vessel, three times. Then they say, oh, but now that I wash my hands, they're pure. So how can I say the mitzvah and say the bracha? So I'm going to touch my shoe. But no, real stories. I've, I've seen that when I was in yeshiva. And I know of guys like this until today. So first touch my shoe. Now my hands need a tila. So you do that. Right? And, but make sure that when you, when you wash your hands, you don't pass the vessel from the right hand to the left hand because the right hand should not be serving the left hand because the right hand is more important. So you have to put it in between. You put it on the counter and then you lift it with the other hand. In short... Netilat Yadayim, which would take you less than 30 seconds, become a five to seven minute ritual. And I, and I know some people would not eat uh, bread because they don't want to go into the hassle of thinking how to wash their hands. And that's only one, one thing. Then you have people who are concerned about whether they said the bracha correctly or not. So uh, then they would say the bracha again. And there is indeed a phenomenon known as religious OCD, you know, the obsessive compulsive disorder, when you have to do things like checking, you know, checking the, if the door is locked seven times before you leave. In extreme cases, you never leave the house because you always go back to check if it's locked or not or if you turn on the gas or the electricity. There, there are some people that anything else in life goes normal, but when it comes to religion, they have OCD. It's called, there's a name for that, it's called scrupulosity. Meaning that one is scrupulous. It's very pe- paying attention to details. So one would, for example, would go from one synagogue to another to hear the shofar, because maybe the shofar here is not good enough. I want to hear that. I want to hear. There was one rabbi who would have a hundred different uh, shofar blowers come to him on Rosh Hashanah. So he would make sure that he did it the right way. So this is the danger of religion. When it comes, when it becomes that, it becomes very dangerous because first, a person separates himself from other because if you don't do it my way, you're not good enough because I always look for more things to do. And second, one really destroys his own life by paying so much attention to those things. Uh, and here comes the Midrash and says, God gave us the Mishkan, the tabernacle, to satisfy our need for things that are quantified and measured and, and uh, defined in a very clear manner. People need that. The Torah is divided, if you look closely, like in all the mitzvot in the Torah, there is a clear divide between two uh, sections of the laws of the Torah. Besides the famous the mitzvot between us and God and between us and other human beings, <coughs> there's another divide. And that's between the mitzvot that are very clearly detailed with numbers and quantities and etc. And the mitzvot that are vague, without, without clear details. For example, take tefillin, the Torah says, Let it be a sign between your eyes. What, what do I write? How do I, what is the size of the tefillin? What, right? well, you would have wanted the Torah to say, you put tefillin, the size of the of the of the piece of the tefillin should be two by two, three by three. The Torah doesn't say that. The Torah says, eat the, eat the, the Pesach, at night, around sunset, 
No clear time. Torah doesn't say exactly when. So those are mitzvot that are between us and and um, Nabi Ben Azra. Those mitzvot that are not so detailed. But everything that has to do with the temple or the tabernacle, the mishkan, the sacrifices, is extremely detailed. The Torah says exactly, take the korban, the sacrifice should be that old. You put with it that, that much oil, that much flour, that much wine, th- that many uh, calves or heifers, whatever it is that you take. Then when you go to the construction of the Mishkan, which is the building of the, thing, of the, of the Mishkan itself, the tabernacle, there are four parashiot in the Torah. About half of the book of Exodus is dedicated to the carpentry and the craftsmanship of the Mishkan. Why is that? Because God wants us to, to live our life in that manner of not being obsessed with the details and falling into the religious OCD that really is detrimental to our uh, religious and our mental health. But God knows also, that God knows that we need that. So He says, okay, here, deal with it in the Mishkan. Even, so even today, when you see what happens in the Bet Knesset, if you look at the literature around Bet Knesset, <coughs> People could go, you know, into, uh, you know, the 30-day years war or 100 years war over practices in the synagogue. If you say the Kaddish before or after, you stand or you sit. You say it all together or only the Hazan. Do you say this phrase on Shabbat? You don't say it on Shabbat. Why are they so obsessed with it? This is where the, the OCD kicks in. This is what happens in the Mishkan. God says, you need the Mishkan just to get rid of that... Uh, uh, of that need for detailed laws that tell you what to do. But that should really be limited only to the temple. Now that you're done with the temple, now that you've built the tabernacle, you're going to take this idea of, uh, of uh, uh, detailed religiosity and apply it to your life. And as a result, you're going to fight with God. Which means that this is what we have today. We have... We have, I don't know how many camps within Judaism that don't talk to each other. They, they used to be the Reform and Conservative and, and Orthodoxy don't talk to each other. But now within Orthodoxy, you have Ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, Modern Orthodox, Open Orthodox, and even one that is called Conservadox. So, and what is happening between all them? We don't talk to each other. Why? Because each one finished building his own tabernacle. Each one got, you know, into the luck, into this world where is we are obsessed with the details. This is how we do it. This is how we are not supposed to do it. But really, the one who suffers most from all of that is our relationship with God. So I think that's what the Midrash is trying to say. It, that build the Mishkan, but that realize that the Mishkan is just a distraction. The real work is on a daily basis on how we respect each other and how we, we work this in a more flexible way.